I want to ask you something even before when you start baking, because you're a law student, you have a degree in law, and um, I'm curious which type of law, first of all, but then the second follow-up question of this is, how does a creative make the decision to take an educational path down the world of law? Um, what what right turn or left turn did you take when you were 16 or 15 that forced you to do this? Enlighten us. Um, I really enjoyed studying law, but when I started working, it just didn't feel it didn't feel right. It wasn't what I was really passionate about, and I wasn't sure what that was. Just sort of a spur of the moment decision. I took a TEFL course and I went to Costa Rica to teach English just to give myself, a, I guess, some distance to do. You were working as a lawyer or paralegal or in a... I, yeah, I worked in a law firm. I did a, an internship program in London and... Wow, okay. Didn't, didn't love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I got to Costa Rica, I was teaching English and I loved it initially, but after about a year, I figured out it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. And while I had been teaching... I really love eating sweet things and I didn't love the desserts I could buy in Costa Rica. I really wanted um, ingredients like butter and real chocolate and they, they bake with margarine and cocoa powder. So I started baking a lot myself and I loved it. And I was making cakes for my students. And then totally out of the blue, a friend asked me to make her wedding cake and I'd never made a cake before, but I said yes. And I started practicing and I just fell in love with it. And that's how I ended up doing that. So. But you're, you're baking skills though like you're talking like from scratch at this point or had you done baking when you were a kid a child family no member? no not, not really no uh, so really totally self-taught i just started searching for recipes i bought some cookbooks and just started playing around oh that's <laughs> amazing right i do relate a little bit because i moved to singapore in 2008 uh from the uk oh. and now, Singapore is a massive food scene now, and it's like world foods, top notch for any kind of food cuisine that you want to find. But at that time, it would have been hard in 2008. And I'm just trying to put a timeline for you as well. 2008 to find like English classic cakes, unless you were going to something like a very high end hotel establishment like oh, Raffles yeah. or something. I remember there was uh, for me, and so it'd be interesting to hear for you in Costa Rica, there was one baking shop where I could get proper flour and I could get butter and I could get cocoa. And I remember going, I just need to make this cake. Was the scene the same in Costa Rica? Yes, there was one baking shop where I could buy uh, not so much ingredients. Ingredients weren't as tough to get hold of. It was expensive yeah. to buy the ingredients I wanted, but they yeah. were available. The things like baking pans and piping tips, which I eventually started using, those were tricky to get hold of because there was one shop and everything was imported from the US. So everything was really expensive. So that was probably the biggest challenge with cakes there. It's so funny though, you're doing this in a country, I mean, I'm assuming you spoke Spanish, you were picking up. I learned it while I was there. Yeah. Okay. So that's a learning curve. You're doing the baking, yes. which is a learning curve. And then... A friend who must trust you to the moon and back to say, hey, make my wedding cake to the non-baker. <laughs> or the I, at least try and baker. <laughs> yeah, try, right? <laughs> How did that end up? <laughs> and it, it didn't fall over. It was a fondant cake. And at the time I was working um, mostly with fondant from while I was in Costa Rica. So um, I learned how to make gum paste roses and... Looking at the photos, it's definitely not fantastic. It's not magazine worthy. It's quite lumpy fondant. Uh, the flowers aren't perfect, but it stood up. Uh, they had a cake to cut. It tasted nice. I understand, though, that the success of being one of the few cake makers, or I think you ended up being called the muffin lady at one point. <laughs> For uh, a while, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, things sort of take, take off because you eventually outgrow the kitchen that you're in. And you make that decision to, that many bakers do, is like, okay, I don't know if I can do this anymore in my own house. I've got to now grow up a bit and get a proper place. So this, this whole transition to do this is coming in. But how fast was that for you? Was that a couple of years into doing this? It was almost exactly one year. I started doing it in the house, but I got to the point, I, I, I somehow just through random contacts, picked up a few business clients. And so I was getting orders for 
500 cupcakes or 500 cookies and they were just taking up every flat surface in the house. So after a few of those, it was just after a big Christmas, which was ridiculous. I started looking for a storefront and I found a place, just an adorable location right on the main road, very walkable next to all the big universities. It was just perfect. And at that point, because I'd been doing it for a year, I'd built up enough of a, I had a Facebook page. That was all I was, had on social media at the time. Um, but I built up enough of a presence there and enough um, regular orders from customers that I just hoped it would transition to a physical storefront. And it did. Uh, I was really lucky with my timing, though, just to, uh, to be clear on how much luck was involved, I think, because I was doing mostly cupcakes at this point and cupcakes were really new. There wasn't a lot of, there was hardly any competition in Costa Rica for cupcakes. And on top of that, very common to have people from North America in Costa Rica. It's not a lot less common to have people from anywhere in Europe. So being an English baker was so exotic. So yeah. English cupcakes were, uh, yeah, very, very exotic. So it made it quite easy for me because I had something that was seen as being very different, very unique and, and just got in on the trend really early. So it just, it really exploded, which was great. So to set up a cake shop in Costa Rica, were there any rules or regulations that you had to get around or uh, how was your Spanish at this point? Because I'm guessing that you would have people coming in and out of uh, the cake shop, probably ordering Spanish too. Yes. By this point, my in Spanish was passable and um, very specific to cake baking. So if I needed to go to the bank or the doctor, I had no idea what to say, but I can tell you how to say anything cake related. But no, the, the law in Costa Rica, I don't know now, but at the time you could own a business um, and you could employ people to work in that business as long as you paid your social security um, or equivalent contributions. So I could hire people and um, eventually had people baking and, and working behind the counter for me. This is amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, did you, any of your friends helping you out with this to like, you know, get you all going or are you just relying on finding, hiring as you do any other business owner? I mean. How did you get the, there? The first lady I hired was a contact through a friend of a friend of a friend who knew someone who had an interest in baking and she turned out to be wonderful. Uh, so that was really lucky. Yeah. And then after that, I think I posted a few times on the, the cake shop was called Sweet Sensation. I posted on the Sweet Sensations page that I was looking for people and they would come in and interview and yeah, and everything just, just worked out. Did you have a plan at the time? Because you'd gone to Costa Rica and I totally get that. You've gone to Costa Rica to go do something completely different and try and like kind of find what you want to do for your future and maybe discover yourself and not be in this corporate grind. And I'm guessing that you had a six month, one year, possibly two year plan out there. And now this is merging yes. into establishing yourself in Costa Rica. Was there a plan behind it or were you just riding the wave? I was definitely riding the wave. I did have a one-year plan when I went out and it got to the end of the year and I just, I loved it. I loved the independence and I loved, I was just learning so much all the time, whether it was Spanish or learning to bake and then starting a business. It was just, it was fascinating. And so, no, I didn't really have a plan and uh, it lasted, I was there for five and a half years, I think, before I eventually left when I originally went out for a year. So it definitely ended up being a, a much more extended journey than I anticipated. That's really very interesting sort of flow of things. But then the journey makes a whole new change, as we understand, because you meet somebody at this okay. point and then everything that you've built up at this point has to sort of change, as I understand, because now you wanted or you needed to move or, I mean, enlighten us here, what happened? Because you ended up in L.A. not too long yes. after you <laughs> meet somebody, so... Your whole life, what did you have to do with sweet sensations and everything else? That was the process. I sold it, which took, took almost a year. And in the, in the meantime, I was applying for all of my residency and everything to move to the US. I met a boy from America and all of his family was there and just seemed like the next logical step. So we moved there together. And then I knew I wanted to stay in the baking world, but I didn't want to start my own business all over. It had been it was an amazing experience, but it was absolutely exhausting and I didn't want to do it again just yet. So I started looking around and I found uh, a chain of cake um, shops. And so I started working for them, managing one bakery and then managing a few and then opening new ones for them. And that was really fun. But then I got pregnant and maternity leave in America is so much shorter than England. It's three months if you're lucky. And after three months, I just couldn't, I couldn't leave. I couldn't put my baby 
into a um, into a nursery or a daycare. So that's when I started thinking about what else I could do baking related that I could do from home so I could be with my baby. <laughs> Did you think that experience of running the cafes, sorry, running your cafe in Costa Rica really helped you to then go and take the next step of actually managing a chain of restaurants because definitely you, you couldn't really go in cold and learn because you'd done all the hard yards so you knew exactly what it takes to build a business so did that help you when you went into that next transition yes I think definitely but also it just was very humbling because I realized how much I didn't know because I had when I opened a business I had no business knowledge I'd never taken a business course I didn't know anything about HR or managing people I really I was so naive and I just figured it out as I went along and I made so many mistakes but working for a company that had systems and structures and processes in place was it made everything a lot easier knowing how to do things and it just yeah it was it was a very different challenge to the one that I had been doing. I really enjoyed it. It's how was your adjustment though of moving to America? I mean, you'd never lived there before. And it's I, quite different to Costa Rica and LA is, you know, on the other end of the spectrum of what you would consider to be a, I don't know, an average. I lived in America for several years myself and mostly in the Midwest, but then I moved further west and west. And it's quite a jump to go from San Pedro, Costa Rica to Los Angeles. You know, how do you manage yes. that? I don't remember that particular part being the challenge. I think it was more just figuring out what I wanted to do, not where I wanted to do it. Um, I think people were very friendly. Mm, it helped that my husband was from California. So initially we had his friends and family to, to start off with. It wasn't moving somewhere new on my own. It's definitely different to Costa Rica, but mm, different, not necessarily in a bad way. Yeah, uh, Things were easier. There were... It was safer, which was nice. And yeah, it was exciting. It was exciting. Yeah, you strike me as someone who quite likes the excitement and having that that change. Had you, before you went to Costa Rica, did you always lived in the UK or had you moved around? No, it's funny. When I chose the name British Girl Bakes, uh, my husband joked that I'm not really British, I'm Brit-ish because I'm not very British <laughs> because I was born in the UK and I lived there until I was five. But then I actually moved with my family to New York and then Singapore. Interesting that you lived there too. And then I studied in Edinburgh and in Canada, and then I moved to Costa Rica, then America. So I've actually, I've only lived, I think, nine years of my life in, in England. I think those skills of just being able to get up and go and move, they're quite interesting to be able to get up and do that, because I don't think everyone can. And it just strikes me that you're like, yeah, I'm going to go to LA. That's fine. No problem. Makes so. sense, though, because it's like your, that's probably your fourth or fifth move by that point internationally. So you know what's not right. so like and I, you're moving with somebody you know so mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's probably one of the more easier transitions now that I think about it and I think so you, you didn't necessarily have to worry immediately about okay what am I going to do for work straight away or anything like that it's just more about okay let's just go and see what happens and I'll make yeah. some I know I've done it before I'll make something of it again which I think is <laughs> the harder bit to see when you hear about moving country or take on the thought of moving country. It can obviously be quite daunting, but at the same time, it's what you make of it and what you put into it that gets you where you are. But was it, when you got there, were was there anything like cupcake shops open or anything like that that you'd seen around LA at that time? Yes. Yeah, yeah so this is now 2015. Oh, okay, um, all right, yeah. 2015. So yes, so uh, cupcakes were a, a big thing there sure. already. Because we, we've actually, now that I think about it, now you say 2015, we've had a guest on from California, Greater LA, who was on uh, Cupcake Wars uh, oh, fun. around that time. And she ended up winning it. And uh, now that I think about it, that is that sort of time frame that you're working with. So that's, so you got into your, for you, this is probably like, oh, this is cool. I can see cupcakes here. I can see all this. But where did the inspiration for you to go and do something for yourself uh, come from? Because obviously you have all the skill and knowledge, but is it was it? Just, did you see someone else doing this, or did you just think, "I oh, no, I've got some knowledge to share. How do I share it? Tell us." Um, so an interesting, I guess, backstory. When I was in Costa Rica and I had the cake shop or the cupcake shop, I would get custom cake orders, and people would want very strange things. And one of the things that someone asked me to make was 
a cake in the shape of a Mercedes. And so I, I thought it, just randomly it would be a fun idea to film it and then share it just to show what goes into the process of making a custom cake. So I set up my phone and I think there must have been a time lapse. Oh, actually, sorry, this is before phones. It must have been my camera. Okay. I used my camera. I took a video of the process, which was hours long of making this car shaped cake. And then I sped it up and I couldn't find out how to put it onto my Facebook page without getting it through YouTube. So I ended up putting it on YouTube. Totally forgot about it. And then when I was at home with the baby, I was writing some notes down, thinking about possibly writing a book about the Costa Rica experience. And I remembered this video and I went to look at it and it had over 100,000 views on YouTube. Oh, And wow. I was blown away. <laughs> and at the same time, this is why I'm thinking, how can I stay home with the baby instead of going back to work? And I thought, what if this could be a thing? What if I could make videos of interesting ways of making cakes and share them? And that could potentially be an option as a job to stay at home. And my challenge was that I think buttercream is a bit more interesting to watch than fondant. And I had worked almost exclusively with fondant on cakes. So I started playing around with buttercream and trying to teach myself how to make buttercream cakes. But whenever I was watching anything on YouTube to try and learn something, I found the videos are really difficult to follow because most videos at the time anyway, was so beautifully edited and the process looked so smooth and easy. And then I would try to do it. And there, there must have been steps missing, like the uglier parts which weren't shown. And I, I didn't know how to troubleshoot that for myself. So I, I, I waded through the process, but then eventually thought, actually, it would be quite fun to make tutorials that weren't perfectly beautiful, that also showed the bad bits, like the piping bag exploding yeah. onto the cake or how to <laughs> fill in the weird air bubbles you get in your frosting, those sort of things. So that's what my, my goal was. The idea behind the, the videos was let's break tutorials down so step by step that someone who's never made a cake before can follow it and get the same result. So that was where the, the YouTube channel started. That's brilliant because you probably would have thought found all these comments from people uh, saying all these questions and you've just not even looked at this video for years and people just thought, oh, well, this sucks. She's posted a video. She doesn't respond to anything. <laughs> you know. And then, oh, sorry, guys. There's like 500 questions here on how to do this. Did you have, um, <laughs> during that time where you got 100,000 views on your uh, Mercedes cake, did you grow a following base? So when you logged on, was it like a thousand followers or? No, it was a few hundred. Okay. It wasn't huge. I was, I, I had expected it to be more because based on how many views. We hear quite a lot that, to, especially for like YouTube, growing to that first a hundred is really hard and then a hundred to a thousand is hard. And then it can start to propel itself and grow uh, from there. Yes. Is that what you found when you started posting uh, videos and content online? Yes. Just to clarify that this Mercedes car cake was on the Sweet Sensations YouTube oh, okay. channel, which I don't own anymore. I sold the business. So it was, yes, it did have lots of um, views and it. it had started gaining a following, but I had to start from scratch with British Girl Babe. And so, yes, definitely the first hundred. Actually, sorry, the first hundred was actually probably the easiest because I just sent a mass email out to everyone I knew and said, please subscribe to this channel because maybe not anymore, but at the time you needed a hundred subscribers before you could choose your own URL. So if I wanted it to be youtube.com slash British Girl Bakes, I needed at least 100 subscribers. So I emailed everyone and got that first 100. But then getting to 1,000 was slow. It took mm. months, months, uh, mm. probably six months to get to 1,000. And, and how often? Um, and that was, I, I posted it every week. I have posted every week since January 2017 because I read somewhere that the algorithm likes consistency. So that's my whatever other priorities i have to have one youtube tutorial every week having that kind of consistency for your following as you grow is, is it becomes like habitual right it's i mean it's like listening to this podcast we try to put one out every week and you feel like okay well there's something there and if you're subscribing and you just pop onto youtube you're going to see it right there it is the the latest video from british girl bakes and you'll watch and and you just get that following and that loyalty and it's sort of it's a bit more consistent than what you see on instagram or mm. you're compete it seems like you're competing with a lot more people but with youtube i don't know because maybe you can display so much more on the screen especially if you log on from a laptop or a tv loads of your subscriptions like appear so there's a really good chance that you're going to be up there and people will see you mm. in just almost immediately so having a consistent set of content, I think does two things. I think it gives you that loyalty. But the second thing is 
when you are lucky enough to get to the point of starting to monetize it, when you look at now since 2017, weekly, you know, you're talking hundreds of videos, there's hundreds of opportunities to display an ad for that can be monetized for you if people end up deciding to go back through the archives of British Girl Bakes and think, oh, yes. where's that Mercedes cake that she kept talking about, you know, and then you don't find it. But, but so I think there's an advantage to doing that, but that consistency must be uh, a fight or a bit of a struggle from time to time. You're trying to go on holiday at one point. You're maybe you, you just wake up and you struggle with have create. babies. Yeah. You have kids, yeah. you have that creativity, Lock. lack of creativity barrier, you know, whatever you want to call it. I mean, there must be several experiences like this where you just sat there and go, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to create. Yes. Yes. At the beginning, because I had comparatively so much free time, I was doing it was taking me a week to make the video and share it and that was it. Whereas now, because I have so much less time, it's more, I'll do it in bulk. So I'll, I'll do two or three months of videos at a time. I'll brainstorm the titles. I'll make a bunch of cakes and try and use each cake for different elements of different tutorials. So I'm really getting the most out of each cake. And then, yeah, sort of batch creating and then I'll script and I'll audio and I'll edit and I'll upload and schedule all of those videos. So that then they're set up for the next three months and then maybe I can spend the next month or two working on a course for my online cake school or, or something else. Or actually, I just got back from a month visiting family in England when I didn't have to work because I'd scheduled everything ahead. So it's, yeah, doing it every week is, it, it is a, a, I guess, a burden. It's a, it's a lot to, to coordinate, but it does give you a lot of flexibility because you can schedule things in advance. It's your job as well. I mean, that's like your primary, you know, work life is doing this. So it, you kind of have to prioritize it a little bit. So do you say that you, yeah. you batch bake a load of cakes then as well when you're doing a load mm -hmm. of videos and just... Yeah, I'll try and bake about once a month. Okay. And then I, just, I have three freezers. I just fill up all of the freezers with cake layers. And then I'll do a week of just crumb coating and, and maybe frosting all of the cakes. And then, and then one by one, I'll go through the decorations. So it's a, uh, it's a slow process because I do it in, in so much in bulk, but it does mean I can be the most uh, efficient with my time by spending it either baking or frosting or decorating or editing so yeah. I can get more done because right. I have such short periods of time to work with. I've right, so I was just going to ask you, it sounds like she's, she's a one-man show here. I mean, she, uh, you don't have any help, do you? It doesn't sound like Not anyone's yet. helping you do any of this. No, that's pretty. My husband has a background in sales and marketing, so he sometimes will come up with really, really catchy titles for my YouTube videos. He taught me about email marketing, so I have a newsletter. So he's definitely helped with a lot of behind the scenes setting up of things, just because I didn't know anything about marketing. Um, so that's been really useful. But no, I'm the only one who does the um, everything else. It's literally incredible, Emily, because I'm thinking that you have like hundreds of cake decorating tutorials online and just to name a few you got like from flower pot to textured fish fault line rainbow zigzags painting bus cream, so 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 many more and i just think there's a lot of time that goes into baking then there's another load of time that goes into decorating and filming and editing and creating content behind the scenes and I can't imagine the amount of camera angles plus all your online content which you sell online as well and email marketing it is exhausting and you have three kids it's a lot but I think what works really well is because I do have three little ones there one almost one three and five and I spend so much time with them, which is amazing because I have this flexibility. But at the same time, spending so much time with them really motivates me to do cake things because it's my release. It's my mm -hmm. escape. When they go to bed at night, I could just sit and watch TV. But instead, if I actually make something, if I, if I do something, I feel so productive in such a nice way. And even if I've had a really hard day of parenting and the kids have been absolutely awful and I feel a massive failure as a mom, I can have a little win, like a lot of views on one of my videos or something that happens professionally which makes the day seem a bit more of a success so it's a nice balance having having the two and I think having the cakes to keep me sane makes me a better parent and then having the parenting to make me more motivated to spend time on the cake stuff really works to to help both sides of that it's like an outlet right that both of them become quite efficient so you probably time box your 
you know, when you are working. So how can I be most efficient with these hours in the day? I've only got two hours, yeah. so I need to really maximize those two hours. And hey, it's in the morning. That's probably when I've got the most mental energy. So that's why I'm going to apply into editing or, uh, I don't know, filming or something rather than exactly um, uh, going through comments on YouTube or answering stuff, which you might do later in the evening. So yeah. one question I have is, A, you must consume a lot of content yourself because you're always coming up with new ideas um, and trends and predicting trends and all sorts of stuff. It, like, your content is amazing. It's all over the place with help and advice and tips and tricks. Do you ever get like a block? And, and do you feel the pressure as well? There's sometimes that you just have those weeks where you're just like, I do not know. I do not want to look at cake stuff. I know personally for me, um, and we, we're online and we consume a lot of content that sometimes I have to say to myself, nothing. I need to look at nothing and just uh, recharge or read a book or take a bit of time away from the business. I think, honestly, that's how I feel with Instagram. I get so burnt out just looking at Instagram because I think with YouTube, I set myself this goal. I need to do one YouTube video a week and that's manageable. I can do that. So that's fine. With Instagram, I, I used to try and post every day and I just couldn't keep up with it. So now whenever I go on there and I see people are posting every day, I just feel, I feel like I'm failing because I, I really can't keep up. I just had to prioritize. And since my cake school makes the most money and then YouTube, those were the ones that got prioritized and then Instagram just kind of got dropped. So I'll occasionally share something when I feel motivated to, uh, but when I don't feel motivated, I just don't. And so that one just sort of fell off the, the to-do list. <laughs> But it, I mean, something's got to give at some point. But I mean, mm -hmm. I I was I would even suggest you know you got to go where the revenue is in many cases, and also that works best for you. I I did see an article actually where you did describe how you do time box your days. It's unteachable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Where you bl you break into two hour chunks quite well, or and then you might have this long two to eight p.m window with the kids and like dinner and getting ready for bed and all that but that then allows you another couple hours later to wind down but also maybe finish off some stuff you need to finish off for the day it all sounds great in the perfect day when the kids are cooperating and no one's sick and all this then, and that was pre-baby and then okay well so yeah <laughs> so how much has that time boxing daily schedule structure changed now changed a lot um, because I had a baby almost a year ago and he's been home with me so now it just revolves around his nap um the last few weeks um well we're about to go into school starts here in two weeks and so my oldest two will be going into school and preschool and then I just have to figure out what I want to do with the baby and um, probably get a babysitter for a few hours a day just so I can keep on top of things so yeah, it's difficult to schedule and I do end up doing most of the things after bedtime, which is uh, not ideal. I prefer to do it earlier in the day when you mentioned, Rachel, it's, you're much more productive earlier in the day when you're not exhausted. Yeah, everything's up a, a bit up in the air at the moment. I don't really have a plan of how things are going to work over the next few months, but I'm hoping, hoping with maybe some childcare that I'll be able to have a more reliable schedule and be able to plan things properly. It's a bit, I mean, it, you've got to do what you've got to do, right? In this situation, I was wondering though, with the popularity of your YouTube and I mean, even your Instagram, you've got, you're nearing on 300,000 followers, which is a humongous yeah. uh, feat, you know, in itself, even if it took you many, many years, it's still a big number. Has that brought in um, brands, let's say, to come and work with you on doing you know, brand-based content collaborations and things like that, that is maybe something that you didn't actually consider or factor into your day. And now there's a new opportunity that you've got to try and find the time to. Has that, have you had these things happening as well? Yes, that's, and that's a very real way of, of describing it. How do you fit it in? I have done some brand work with, um, with brands like Amazon and with uh, Skillshare and it's fun, it's exciting, it's something new, but it's also really difficult to carve time out for it because I think when you're already sort of at your at your maximum bandwidth, something has to give if you want to take on new projects. So I like the idea of working with brands. It's challenging or it has been challenging while I've had such young children at home. Um, 
but I'm hoping as they get a bit older, things get easier and there ends up being more flexibility and, and time to do things like that. I, I think that's a very realistic answer. And I really appreciate you saying it that way, because I think there'll be a lot of people listening to this, you know, hearing about people do these brand deals and what and what opportunities that can bring, which is which is great. But then there's that that dose of reality in there of like, well, hang on, doing one of those and content for one of those could take you one or two days if you're not really used to it. Oh, right. Easily, and and yes. where do you take one or two days out of your week? To... Yes, and when a day is usually three hours. Yeah, right. And you you may have a more you know they may put a deadline on you and but other things. You know, it could be just it's a season in your life right now. So right now you've got young kids, but you've also got a baby as well. So it, it's a different season. And I think you may get to a point where you go, okay, the, it takes me a lot of time to produce YouTube content, and it might be at some point you go, okay, I don't want to do that anymore or commit to this weekly basis. Because, so that then that frees up your headspace to think about other avenues or doing different things. And so you may pivot as you go along um, in your journey so that then you can take on different projects. That There may be a really good brand deal or you might come out of your own British Girl range of, baking um accessories or you know other, other things that that you would need that headspace or working with um a big supermarket chain i don't know there's lots of opportunities out there but it, it i think that there's always a season in our life and sometimes you can push and sometimes you have to like hold back and just just maintain and that's okay as well right i think that's been the most difficult part of the of the last year is going from having quite large chunks of time because my kids were both in preschool to having the baby where I have these tiny snippets of time. So just accepting that this is a season that I'm just going to have to give up on some things and I'm going to have to watch the business stop growing or grow more slowly for a year or two and just be okay with that. I think, you know, it's an inspiration just to stick in there because I'm sure there's many moments where you're just like, I cannot do this. I cannot maintain all of this. Yeah. And I think it's a real conundrum for parents, like juggling young kids. It's like just holding in on and just maintaining your career and sanity is a big achievement. So you should don't, don't be so hard on yourself, yeah. honestly, because yeah. I think it's really we can be really hard on ourselves because we're like, well, we should be able to do this. I've seen someone else can do that or I've seen, you know, et cetera. And sometimes you just got to be able to just let go a little bit or just go, all right, I just, what do I need to do to cover the basics this week and, and then get perspective? I'm sure there's lots of conversations with your husband where you're like, I've had enough. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> just to add to Rachel's point, um, now I know you've said in the past on other interviews that you're quite nerdy in the technical sense. You love, you know, the aspects of editing and, and the, the feeling of putting together a video and editing it all yourself and and i agree it's actually a lot of fun to do it but man is it time consuming i mean for each minute of video you're talking you can spend half an hour editing right if you want to add loads of interesting effects or timings or cuts or whatever so you ever yeah. stop to think like okay well maybe maybe i could just offload some of that to somebody else just to do that bit and then yeah, maybe reintroduce it later back to me you know yes that's the biggest uh discussion my husband and i have that he thinks outsourcing is the way to go because he sees me spend so much time on the editing uh but it's difficult it's di I, it's difficult to relinquish relinquish control on something that i feel i do the best way and so letting someone else take over and do it their way is is difficult it's definitely something that's that's on the on the to-do list to think about and find someone who can edit in a way that i really like and probably does it a lot better than me but uh, it's also, I think, the the biggest block for me is the setup. Once it's up and running, yes, excellent, massive time saver. But the process to get it going of finding all new systems that work for me and an editor so that we're on the same page and just setting everything up is just mm -hmm. such a massive time-consuming commitment. I just don't have time to carve that no, yeah. out of my life at the moment. You're so you're maybe a few months down the line. Yeah. You're literally holding on right now, making sure that you can get those yes. episodes done. So. Maybe that will exactly. come. So when you came onto YouTube and started producing a lot of your content, it was probably not as competitive as it is now. So a lot of successful bakers, um, 
they sell their own buttercream, they have their own t- tutorials, they have uh, recipes, all sorts of stuff. It, it seems like you hit a certain number on Instagram or social media and then you can start to monetize that or sell your recipes, etc., to your audiences. Now, you have the advantage of that you've grown a big following and you started a lot earlier on and you've got a lot of loyal people, um, a lot of huge, huge views on YouTube. But how do you stay ahead in such a competitive landscape? And have you noticed that it changes to um, any of that profile of people? Like, there's a big wave now coming on of people selling a lot of recipes. Does that impact you or does it just mean that there's more people baking? I think definitely with COVID, the number of people who started baking just skyrocketed. But as far as competition, I honestly, I I don't use social media much personally. And so I'm not very aware of what's going on with the rest of the cake world. I follow different bakers on Instagram and I don't follow any on YouTube. So I don't really know. I wouldn't be the one to ask whether I notice people sharing more recipes or what other people are doing. I definitely should be more on top of it. But it's the same with trends like TikTok. It took me forever to get on there. And uh, I gave up after about a month because I couldn't handle so many accounts. I'm just in my own little little zone at the moment, just working on my stuff and, and trying to, to get that done. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, actually, I was just going to say, going back to that relinquishing you know, responsibility point, you know, I mean, we've spoken to so many bakers who won't even go and hire someone to come in and clean after they finish baking because it's just like, well, I'll just do it myself. You know, it's my domain. It's my control. It's, you know, and even that, that's okay. So finding a cleaner is not exactly something that you need to find like with an editor, right? It's not like you have to gel on the same style and design and let's say <laughs> workflow and all this. You just have to find someone to wash your dishes. But even then that can still be a struggle just for somebody to go and say, all right, I'm going to go do that. But then you've got to have set hours of when you're doing those yeah, things, so right? <laughs> it's so tricky True. to balance this in that way. But I, yeah, yeah I, I would go back to the, what Rachel's asking, you know, on this, on the, uh, the trends and other things, you know, you mentioned TikTok. What a struggle, right? Like you, here's a new platform that you can be crazy successful at, but you have to almost unlearn everything that you've been doing for the last few years on another platform like Instagram to be successful on YouTube in some respects, or YouTube, TikTok in some respects. You could say YouTube too, actually, to be honest, because it's not like the same content always carries across each platform. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yes. So you put so much effort into one platform. How much more effort do you need to put into to repurpose it? Sometimes it works. Sometimes it just doesn't. You have an Instagram reel that I think has something like 6.6 million views. It's insane. Oh, the melting cake. cake. That's a cake that's just melting in 70 degree, 22 centigrade. Yeah, in an hour. And you just, like, you put that up there. You never thought that was going to be at 6.6 million view. Like, real, right? You say, this is just some of the randomness of this still comes into play. There's obviously a lot of formulas and things you can do and and the content you can create to be successful, but there's also stuff that just comes out of nowhere, right? You just think, and then you're so excited. So I share the same thing on YouTube and it gets like a hundred views. <laughs> There's no method behind the madness. <laughs> yeah. so, so anyway, you have your own little baking studio in your house. Is that correct? I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that come at a certain point in your life where you're just like, I need a place where I can just close off from everyone and not be mom, 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 I need this. Or I want to get on a midway through filming. Did it come about because of um, something to do with the children or was it just that you needed a separate space just to put your head into and and it almost go into work mode for yourself? Uh, A combination of those. The first studio I had was the dining room table in our first apartment in LA. Um, And then the next two were in garages uh, of where it was just the only place where I could put all of my stuff and leave it there and not have to clean up before every meal. And I could also control the lighting uh, by using artificial lights. And then you wouldn't know if I'd done it during a morning nap or if I'd filmed after bedtime at night, the light wouldn't be different. So garages. And then we moved to this current house uh, two years ago and there was a dining room and we don't usually eat in the dining room. So we decided to turn it into a studio. And it's been absolutely magical because you mentioned I live in Texas. And so summers are insanely hot, like 
insanely hot in the 40s Celsius. And then winters, it freezes. And so when I was in the, in the garage frosting a cake in summer, the frosting would literally, the buttercream would just be melting off the cake. And I could only keep it out of the fridge for two or three minutes at a time. And then, and also I was just absolutely drenched. It was so hot. And then in winter, the frosting would freeze onto the cake as I was trying to smooth it. And I, I, just, I couldn't oh, work because nightmare. it was so cold. So now I'm in an air conditioned room. The temperature's the same. I have my lighting set up. It's just, it's so much easier. And it's convenient because it's right here in the house. But I do have doors that close so, so I can shut off and just be in my own little world for a bit. That's pretty cool. And like, give us a, are you in the studio right now? I am. So what sort of equipment, like how many lights do you use? How many cameras? Do you just use phones? Do you have a proper camera? Like how does it all work? I'm just curious. I have two, I have two proper cameras, um, Canons, and then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven um, like big soft box lights. Yeah. Should I try and turn the camera to show you? Yeah, why not? Let's have a Up quick look. Ceiling. I don't know. Just to see if we, we can, can see okay, the, yeah. so these are the lights like mounted for, on the ceiling. For people listening, imagine going in for your photo family photo shoot in the studio and you got those big white lights that's what we're looking at here that's really cool uh, so yeah kids obviously aren't kids uh, no kids in this room stay, stay well out. well we say that but i have seen uh oh, your yes. boys that they've got uh, they've also got their own little insta instagram page as well right uh i actually just took it down but okay. yes it was they <laughs> They've been watching me film and they were just desperate to do it themselves. And we bake a lot together, but never filmed it. So about a year ago, they asked me to turn the cameras on and to let them bake. And they did. And it was adorable. And I did the editing and I showed them the video. And they were so proud to see themselves on the screen. They absolutely loved it. And they say what I think are the cutest things while they're baking. But I just started to think these are the sort of things that they're saying that they might be really embarrassed about when they're teenagers and they don't they're three and five they don't really understand when something goes online it's there yeah. potentially forever mm. they're not really they're not really old enough to grasp this concept so i felt i you know i just started to feel uncomfortable about sharing their stuff when they're not really mature enough to agree to it so i ended up taking it down and maybe we'll put it back up in the future i am going back and forth in my head about it at the moment but yes they love baking i do still like the bake in the studio that's the only time they're allowed in here because there are so many cameras and tripods and wires around. It's not the most child safe place. I'm just always impressed that bakers' kids like baking because my two kids just have no interest in it, no interest in my cakes, unless it's like literal cake scraps, but. And only chocolate. Only cho yeah, in possibly chocolate, but. Mine are the same, only chocolate. <laughs> and I bring out <laughs> cakes or I take them to friends' houses. Have you got ice cream? They don't want my cake. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe it's because most of my cakes, I will frost and refrost and refrost again until they're not edible. Or if I do do it really quickly, I'll give it away to someone because we have, you know, I've had so much cake in my lifetime. I don't need more cake. Mm. So I give it away. So they actually very rarely get cake on their birthdays. Maybe if I make it for a special occasion, but they're still very intrigued by cake i'll have to get them to meet my kids and maybe they'll be inspired of it yeah yeah <laughs> i it, it, it right next to me is our dessert fridge where rachel will put all the cakes that she makes and we, we use for content and we don't refrost a lot of stuff because we do end up giving everything to people obviously because hey look it's free cake and you know great way to get some favors in with some people is drop off you know if someone needs to do a school pickup for you because you can't be there on time and all this but um yeah the kids are just not they're just so desensitized to it it's yeah like, go look in the fridge uh. but i think actually it's my therapy it's my outlet so half hour said to me oh maybe you should just refrost or do something i'm like no but i quite enjoy this whole process of uh, decorating and creating and Although it takes time, it, it's my time out in some ways as well. Um, so I, I quite enjoy totally understand that. taking that process and creating something um, from scratch, even though it would probably save me hours and hours of time if I didn't do that. But I think it keeps me sane as well, baking. So <laughs> yeah, totally so, understand. <laughs> so for you then, now we talked about this, you know, a season, quote unquote, that you're in, obviously, with a very young child that's sort of getting in the way of you being able to be 100% productive. But where do you see the future for your brand, British Girl Bakes? I mean, what other things are out there that you think you'd like to do that you haven't got to do yet? And you're just sort of holding time until that opportunity comes. The kids are a bit older, you get a bit more free time. 
what's what's on that bucket list? Um, a few things. I during COVID, just before COVID started, I was going to teach at a few different places and um, across the US, which it was quite fun. We had this tour set up, and then COVID happened, and that that didn't work out. I would like to to potentially revisit that again. Um, I've also had some requests to be on different TV programs, which just sound amazing, but the timing just wasn't right with really young children. But now that they're all getting a bit bigger, I like the idea of doing that again um, or actually following through with that. So I'm open to lots of different avenues. I don't have a very clear idea of where I want the business to go. So lots of lots of possibilities to explore. I, it's very cool. I, I guess that's why you're growing your YouTube platform so that those offers still stay there as well, because this is stuff that you want to do it's just it's a time restriction right now so that that's your limitation and i'm sure they will still be there because you've been doing this for years now so it's not going to go away i remember when i got into baking around 2017-18 and your youtube was starting to blow up around that time so i do remember seeing a lot of your tutorials coming up oh board. really yeah, how funny yeah 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 <laughs> definitely you and George's mm. Cakes on YouTube were definitely ones when I was looking for tips of how to do certain things. It's amazing how sometimes life takes its own twists and turns. But yes. um, one question I have uh, before we go into our wrap up round was what advice would you give to bakers who were interested to start a platform like you have on YouTube doing tutorials? Um, but maybe lack that confidence in, in getting started or don't necessarily want to put their face in front of the camera. Is there anything that you've learned over the years? As far as not putting your faith in front of the camera, I hardly ever showed my face um, at the beginning for the same reason I hate talking into the camera. I hate hearing. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely possible to do it without showing your face. You can do, I initially did very close up videos where you could never see me in the videos. I'd sort of stand to the side, scraping the frosting <laughs> around the side of the cake so you couldn't see me. Um, which meant also I could do it in my pajamas as a bonus. Um, but yeah, so it, you definitely don't have to show your face. As far as tips for starting out, I think it's difficult because Typically, people's inspiration to starting a channel is that they've seen something else be hugely successful and they want to do the same. So you have these really unrealistic expectations for your own channel or account. So somehow really lowering those expectations and expecting it to be really slow to grow. And what goes with that is making sure that you're doing something you absolutely love. So if you're, if you're not passionate about, say, cake decorating tutorials, if that's what you want to do, don't start because you're going to burn out because if you have to put in a year or two before your account gets really big, that's that's a lot of time to be spending on something that you're not really enjoying and also not really getting any returns from. Mm, wise word. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. I appreciate all that. Listen, we're going to wrap up with our quick fire question round. First oh. thing that comes to mind, you can use for your answer. You can explain it or you don't have to explain it. Totally up to you. I'm going okay. to start. Can you tell me what is your preference, American buttercream or Swiss meringue buttercream? American buttercream. Okay. Fantastic. It, it, is that because it's faster to make? Faster to make. Um, I think it's more versatile. It's so easy to store if you want to make it in batch and then freeze it and use it later. Uh, and I love the flavor. Oh, amazing. <laughs> um, one aspect of baking you won't compromise on. I think having a stand mixer. I hate baking with a hand mixer. Oh, gosh, that's a good one. That takes me back so far with the hand mixer. <laughs> I, I actually remember those days. You know, those things that get pop out and you clean separately. I just used to take ages to get the butter and the yes, sugar yes. white. You used to spend like eight minutes oh. on high. Yes. Or when the, when the bowl doesn't automatically spin in the mixer. Um, I know my mom's didn't. I think maybe it was broken. And so you're spinning the bowl with one hand and, oh, it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How about if you have a baking book from your bookshelf you would like to recommend? I don't think I have any. Oh, uh, that's okay. That's all right. We've had that answer before as yeah, well. So that's true. It's... Not everyone has a collection for sure. I don't. Some people just jump on YouTube and or Google search. Yeah. BBC for good food. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, who would you want to make your next birthday cake? Duff Goldman. Oh, well, that was instant. 
<laughs> yes. He so when I started doing cakes in Costa Rica, I the TV I had, the only thing that was available that I was interested in watching was Duff Goldman's cake show with the Ace of Cakes. Ace of Cakes. Ace of Cakes. And so when I would get home in the evenings, that was always playing and I would watch Ace of Cakes and he did these amazing cakes with fondant that would like a rocket that would shoot into the sky and then you could eat it or a guitar that you could actually play and then eat. And it was fascinating and really inspiring for someone who's just starting out with fondant cakes. And so I absolutely worship him. He's my, he's my cake god. And I've tried meeting him a few times at different events. It's never worked out. Oh, no. Uh, but yeah, absolutely him. <laughs> All right. If you're listening, Duff Goldman, please. <laughs> yes, please. Reach out <laughs> either to us. We'll connect you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was just really, really nice. I really appreciate you taking your time amongst your extremely busy day yeah. to squeeze in was... an hour and have a little chat with us. Honestly, it's been really, really lovely. Thanks for parting all this wisdom and advice too. We really appreciate no, it. It's been really fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks. You're welcome.